Today's guest is Katherine Morgan Schaffler. She's a psychotherapist, writer, and speaker, and the former on-site therapist at Google. She earned her bachelor's degree in psychology at UC Berkeley before obtaining two masters from Columbia University, one focused on clinical assessment and the other on psychological counseling. Additionally, she's completed most postgraduate training and certification at the Association of Spirituality and Psychotherapy in NYC. Today, I'm bringing Catherine on to talk about her recently published book, The Perfectionist Guide to Losing Control, which is designed to help you understand your intense drive to excel more deeply and more usefully, then exploit all that freshly liberated energy into service of your most authentic self. In today's podcast, we'll talk about the different types of perfectionism that you might fall under and how to harness and own that to be your very best self. It's such a pleasure to welcome Catherine to the show. Catherine, I'm so excited to have you on the show. I love deep diving sort of my, I guess, my personal psychology, like getting to know myself, getting to know why I make certain decisions and I think your career really started as a psychotherapist at Google, working with powerful women. You kind of honed in on really successful women and understanding perfectionism. And in your new book, Perfectionism and How to Use It to Your Advantage, we get to kind of dive in and um, break down how to help our listeners in the community. And you can psychoanalyze me too on the show. <laughs> but I'm so excited to have you because this is something I've I mean, as an entrepreneur of, you know, over a decade have really been curious mm -hmm. about like how and why I make decisions. And I told you before we started, I took your quiz and I'm an, a messy and Parisian perfectionist. So I'd love to go through the different types of perfectionism and, um, and how it can hold us back and how we can move through it and use it to our advantage. So thank you for being here. Thank you for, thank being you for having me. Len, I'm excited I, to be here and have this conversation with you because I do think it applies so much, especially to the entrepreneurial space, but particularly to women and women who are really ambitious. Well, let's talk about your background first because you're a woman who's really ambitious. Um, how'd you get your start? So I always knew I wanted to be a therapist. It's kind of a strange job to always know <laughs> that you want to have. But I always did. I always loved psychology. I majored in an undergrad um, right out of college. I went into counseling. I worked in a residential treatment center in LA with kids and families who had been abused and neglected in the foster care system. And so they were now wards of the state. So they lived on site and they went to school on site. And I was a counselor there for many years. And then I wanted to go to graduate school. So I moved to New York. Um, I started my own practice and worked at a rehab in Brooklyn. And a few years later, I worked on site at Google. Um, and by nature of where I lived in the city, which I did not realize at the time would impact who came into my office so much. But, you know, New Yorkers are like, want a therapist on the block, right? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much um, proximity determines a lot of our decisions, actually. And so I lived way, way downtown. If anyone's from New York or familiar with the area by the seaport, because I love being by the water and walking my two dogs by the water. And my practice was right off of Wall Street, which meant that I saw a lot of women in big law and finance and had this really high achieving perfectionistic kind of demographic. Um, and obviously Googlers kind of the same vein, right? These are sort of like top performers and people who really want to unleash all of their ideas out into the world. And um, rehab, interestingly, has a lot of perfectionists too right? Um, for a myriad of other reasons. And so that's kind of a splash history of my work. So when you started working with these really ambitious women, what were they coming to you with struggles of? Generally, there was this sense of shame is a heavy word, but it's a word I'm going to use. And it didn't present as shame at first, it presented as confusion. 
And the confusion sounded and looked like, you know, I got what I wanted, or I know I'm on the right track to get what I wanted. And I have this lined up and I'm in this relationship and I'm, you know, exercising or doing this or doing that, but I don't feel balanced. And I must be doing something wrong because this isn't how it's supposed to be. I don't feel right. Something's wrong with me. And there was this experience of um, being fractured and then internalizing that fracture as this can't be the result of anything that's happening outside of me. For example, that I'm not in maybe the right job or the right relationship. There's because anybody would want this. Yeah. And so there must be something wrong with, with me, which wasn't the case. The women that I saw, and in general, I think people who go to therapy, like the healthiest people are the ones who get, who connect to support and who want to take a solutions oriented approach to looking at their life from multiple perspectives and, you know, hopefully informed and objective perspectives, which is the point of going to therapy. Um, but they all started echoing the same sentiment of trying to tone down the part of themselves that was quote unquote, too perfectionistic, too ambitious. They were having real struggles, um, professionally being palatable enough, kind of the sense that they had to hide something about what they wanted or how much they wanted it in order to seem healthy. There was an emphasis on seeming healthy, not actually being healthy. It was more performative in a lot of cases. And that wanting and trying to mute how much you want something also held true for relationships of, you know, I'm not supposed to want to be married and have kids like yesterday. I'm supposed to be happy just by myself on this island alone, you know, doing whatever it is that isn't interpersonal in nature. So I just kept encountering these women who were in these double binds where they couldn't win. You know, professionally, they had to really work, want to work, love working, but they couldn't show that too much. It couldn't be too visible about that or else it, it seemed aggressive or to, you know, quote unquote masculine. And they also were supposed to be in a romantic relationship, but based on, you know, what they felt was the external expectation, but they weren't supposed to want it too bad too badly. And it certainly wasn't supposed to be their primary want because their identity should never be, you know, connected to their love life. That should be sort of on the periphery. And so there were just all these directives coming at women about how to be who they are from people who were not them. And they came to see me to get clarity on who am I? What do I want? I think that's the biggest question we all have for ourselves. Like, who am I? And when you're growing up, you have these goals, like I'm going to go to college, I'm going to go to grad school, I'm going to work at this company, I'm going to work my way up. You have these finish line goals. I'm going to get married and have 2.5 mm -hmm. kids and a golden retriever, like whatever it mm -hmm. is that you kind of built up in your brain as something that's going to make you happy or, or it looks perfect from the outside, but it on that journey or getting to those milestones, I think it's normal to have those moments where you're like, wait, was this, is this how this is supposed to feel? Is this what I want is, or right. am I allowed to act this way? Or am I allowed to want more? Um, it's really, I mean, I don't know how you help people through the confusion of that, but in your, in your new book, you say perfectionism is a means of control. Um, can you can you explain that and the difference between control and power and how like letting go can help people? Because it seems like that's really yeah. what you help these ladies well, do. So I offer in the Perfectionist Guide to Losing Control, the, the book, I offer just a completely different way to look at perfectionism because something that annoys me is this 
directive floating around in this self-help personal development space of, of like, don't just don't be a perfectionist, <laughs> you know? Um, and A, there's nothing wrong with being a perfectionist. You can be a perfectionist and be perfectly healthy. Um, perfectionism is not anyone's problem. The problem is how we respond to missteps and whether you respond to those missteps with punishment or whether you respond to missteps with self-compassion, right? And so when I examined what is perfectionism and why is there a huge discrepancy in the research, which looks at perfectionism in a multidimensional kaleidoscopic way. There's there's healthy iterations of perfectionism called adaptive perfectionism in the research. And then there's maladaptive perfectionism, which is like the kind of perfectionism that causes paralysis that we're all more familiar with. And I was really confused about why in our in the in like commercial wellness, we only talk about maladaptive perfectionism and we call it perfectionism. So we're like lumping it all together into this one side without talking about all the other stuff. And this directive to be less perfectionistic and find balance is always directed towards women. And so I really uncovered the way that the perfectionism, perfectionist construct and identity is really being used right now as this implicit placeholder to try to tame women who are ambitious and who want to express power. And it's sort of similar to the way that a lot of people tell young girls and women to not be bossy, Mm -hmm. but we don't use the word bossy with boys or men that's kind of how we are using the word perfectionist, right? So when girls are assertive, we say, don't be so bossy. And what the implicit messaging there is, is you're not supposed to be authoritative. That's not a feminine quality. When, when boys are quote unquote bossy, we call it confidence, right? And so these little language markers are not so little after all it really requires a lot of self-awareness and to what's happening, you know, socioculturally so that we can break free of this idea that a perfectionism is bad in the first place. I mean, it certainly can be destructive. Um, I don't want to be very clear about that, but it can also be really con- constructive and be really helpful. And I think it's a beautiful natural impulse, right. To, to understand that reality and also see an ideal and perfectionists are people who feel this like compulsion actively to try to bridge that gap. And they feel it for their whole lifetime. This is an enduring identity marker. It's like being an activist or being a romantic. And in the same way, you don't tell a romantic, just like believe in love 75% of the time, not all the time. (laughs) That doesn't work for a reason because this is part of someone's identity. And I don't believe in telling people that they need to recover from who they are. I can't stand the phrase recovering perfectionist. Well, just bring up so many amazing points. I can think about just being a little girl or seeing parents, parent little girls and still say she's being bossy or she's a little bit bossy or there's a little bit of a tude or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And it's, and I mean, I am hundred percent guilty of talking with Chris about perfectionism, my husband, Chris, of perfectionism being something that holds him back because I am identifying perfectionism as like the maladaptive form. Like, yeah, you, everything you're doing is good enough. It's amazing. Share it with the world, like get out there. And um, you can kind of break down the where I am in the quiz, messy and Parisian, Parisian, Parisian perfectionist. Um, where I maybe don't hold back things from the world and maybe I need to learn to do that a little bit more, but, um, but it is, I mean, I just, my mind is blown right now to think about how it can be so productive for someone and constructive and an internal drive and ambition Mm -hmm. to greatness. 
Yeah. And you need to embrace it. Right. And you also need to put boundaries around it. And it's really important for women to do this, especially because if you don't, you're going to default into the cultural messaging, which is calm down and go find balance. And I, I don't believe that balance exists. Balance is always like after the holidays or as soon as this very important <laughs> thing is sorted out, or as soon as my kid like gets, you know, over their cold and back into school regularly or whatever it is. And the language here, even just the gender part alone, which I dedicated a chapter to, but that's not even what the whole book is about is so important. And it's like, if you think about the phrase resting bitch face, right? There's no resting jerk face for men. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is that men are not expected to appear pleasing and palatable all the time, Mm. right? And so there's no quote unquote penalty for a man who expresses just a normal facial facial expression because we use language to regulate our behavior. And like the phrase strong-minded, nobody says he's a strong-minded man. Mm. You know, yeah. strong-minded is is like it it has this, this superfluous quality when you attach it to men. We say strong-minded women, and the implicit messaging there is like she's unusual. She has ideas. Yeah, <laughs> she wants to direct those ideas in specific ways. She's strong-minded. Wow, that's really aberrant. Meaning, like that's not feminine. Right. That's why we're pointing it out. And the phrase hot mess is also a descriptor of femininity. When you think of a hot mess, you think of it a very effeminate person. And so perfectionist fits into all of this. And it's being used right now to um, really take power away from women and punish women for wanting more, which is a perfectly healthy drive. Oh, my drop. (laughs) So, (laughs) so how do you, I mean, for the women who came into your office and had this perfectly healthy drive and you just saw the ambition and the follow through and the success and just, I, I can only imagine some of the most amazing lives Mm-hmm. How did you help them work through what didn't feel right? Well, I think it's really about, I think healing is about learning to trust yourself. We often think of healing as like knowing what to do and what are my next steps? What's the next right thing to do? But when we get quiet and still, we already pretty much know what to do, you know? Um, and if we don't know what to do, we know who to go to, to ask for counsel or advice. The thing that gets tricky is trusting yourself. And when you ask yourself the question, what do I really want? Believing your answer. What do I really need? And the problem for high functioning people, meaning people who can do a lot of stuff on the outside and get a lot done, or even just appear to have it all together, but inside be really falling apart in in some way or be, you know, experiencing clinical levels of depression, you would never even know. The problem for high functioning people is there's no crisis. Your boss is never going to call you and say, where are you? You haven't been at work in four days and no one's heard from you. You know, like you can still show up You can still be on time. You can still look look a certain way. And so no one can really hide their suffering better than the highly functioning person. Because also nobody's asking you like, are you okay? You don't seem well because you know how to seem well. You are adept at seeming well. And you can seem really, really, really put together and be completely falling the fuck apart, Mm -hmm. you know? And so because there's no alarms and no bells sounding and no one sort of shoulder shaking you and being like, what's going on? You just end up going through the motions. Mm -hmm. And the more you go through the motions, the more you get used to this feeling of detachment, maybe even a little bit, we might call it dissociation with your life where you're like, this is my job, but I don't feel like I'm like in my, you don't feel really alive in your life. 
And so to answer your question, you get back to a place of just understanding what your values are. And that's a lot, a, a big question to answer. And I use pleasure as a guide back to yourself. And when we think of pleasure, we tend to think of sexual pleasure, but that's not what I'm talking about, although that's not excluded from the mix. But I'm talking about just simple, joyful satisfaction. And if you know what feels good, and if you're trusting yourself to allow yourself to encounter things that feel good and feel bad, you're not numbing out to that stuff, then you use your sense of this feels good, this feels neutral, this feels bad as a guide to move you in the direction that you need to move in. Kim, it's powerful to think about because even with you saying like what feels like pleasure, you know, I have I have visions of being on a yoga mat in a studio that I used to love so much in yoga and mm -hmm. being at the beach with my kids and my husband and like my phone is probably like in a glove compartment of a car. Please don't steal my phone if you know where I go to the beach. Um, mm -hmm. But just like I am present, I am in it. I'm in my body. I am in nature. Like that is mm -hmm. pleasure to me. And yeah. where I come back to connect into this role that I have to support and coach women and men to wellness and host this podcast to have amazing experts like you on is to help people find what makes them happy, what makes them well. And I feel very connected to my, to that role. Yeah. But there are definitely, I think for most people who have built up a life times when you're like, this is not what I want to be doing. And mm -hmm. I don't think for me personally, I mean, there were times when I was in the grind disassociated, like, feels like your short-term memory doesn't work. You're like, mm -hmm. what just happened? How do I kind of like almost can't access a lot. Some of those yeah, memories. Well, stress work. has a big impact on your, on your memory and sleep deprivation has a big impact on your memory. And you know, that stuff is not a coincidence. Yeah. And so, but it is interesting when I look at, I don't know what it is. And I, maybe I've said this on podcast before, the longevity of this career or maybe getting yeah. to your six, seven, eight, where I started and having children, where I started just making decisions. Like I'm not going to have my day be like this. I'm going to block schedule this mm -hmm. way. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm doing that now. And I don't know, maybe it's stepping into the, into the position of I am the boss. I'm going to be the boss. I'm going to make decisions mm -hmm. for myself and my family that are in alignment. And then you have more of that neutral and pleasurable experience and less of the negativity, which in the beginning of my career felt like just part of what I had to do to yeah. achieve what I wanted to achieve or to build what I wanted to build. And maybe that was the case, or maybe it's just, I finally got to a place where I was like, I can have boundaries. I can make yeah. my own decision. I can be bossy you know, and own it. But you know what, <laughs> Kelly? I'm so glad you brought that up because I think you're speaking really honestly. And I think when we start our careers, it is a little bit of um, you have to do what you're told before you can do what you want. And there is uh, there is like a kind of more of a grindy feel to it. That's not that optional. And I don't right. think we do anyone a disservice to pretend that that's not true. That doesn't have to continue one. And in the midst of that sort of like stressful paying your dues moment in whatever career you find yourself in, I think a lot of people, and this is what I do when I'm under a lot of stress, if I'm not paying attention, substitute immediate gratification for pleasure. And immediate gratification is not a substitute for pleasure because there is no substitute for pleasure. And I think people do this a lot with food, right? Of like, I'm going to give myself the chocolate cake because I deserve to feel good right now. Mm -hmm. And actually it's maybe the chocolate cake brings you true pleasure, but maybe in this moment, it's also not making you feel pleasure because you feel guilty or whatever it is after eating it, or it, it, you know, 
messes up your um, energy levels and then you end up feeling bloated, whatever. It, it, it is something that seems intuitive and natural of what brings us pleasure. But if we're out of the practice of it, we don't know. And I, I create the distinction of pleasurable acts and immediate gratification both feel good in the moment. But a truly pleasurable acts, like the beautiful ones you're describing, um, feel good when you're anticipating them and they feel good when you're recalling them, right? So um, this is a model called the AER model, where you look at something from the three stages of the way you experience it. We don't just experience the event itself, right? We experience the anticipation of the event and the recall of the event. So this, you know, famous psychologist um, posed this question in a TED talk of like, what kind of vacation would you plan if you had no memory of it? And people are like, oh, I don't know. Uh, you know, because being able to recall pleasurable things that you did is a big part of satisfaction. Being able to anticipate is also a big part of satisfaction. And we get totally over-indexed on the thing itself. When it's immediate gratification, there's a lot of anxiety in the anticipation of like, oh, I hope I don't indulge. I hope I don't want to do too much of that. And when it's immediate gratification, there can often be a lot of guilt in the recall of like, oh, I did it again. I stayed up all night watching this show and now I'm tired and I didn't do what I needed to do. With pleasurable stuff, you know, taking a walk in nature, for example. I'm not anticipating doing that and thinking, oh, I hope I don't, I hope I don't walk for too long. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm certainly not recalling it being like, God, I went, I went for a walk in nature again. Like, when am I going to learn? You know, it's like, (laughs) it's just a simple, joyful satisfaction. And that's one way to begin to just create buckets of like, oh, this thing that I'm doing to decompress, drinking a glass of wine or watching TV really late at night is actually not pleasurable. It's just immediate gratification. It's a cardboard cutout of pleasure. What would bring me real pleasure? And it's very simple things, very simple things, you know, sleeping in a cotton t-shirt. Yeah. So anything like, you know, just random, simple stuff. You, nobody's asking anyone to reinvent the wheel here. Wow. I love that you bring up such a simple example because I think we overcomplicate things. Like, yeah, I love we do. It. And sometimes love- you have to put language to what brings you pleasure. So even if you're doing it anyway, just so that you can signal to yourself, like I am attending to you, you know, so if you're going to light a candle anyway, or sleep in a comfy, clean cotton shirt anyway, if you say out loud or to yourself, like I am doing this to bring myself pleasure, it might move the needle a little bit and help and keep you awake to the intentionality that you're bringing to your day. Circling back to perfectionism and its link or connection to happiness, Mm -hmm. you're bringing up these pleasurable experiences and the difference between pleasure and instant gratification. How can perfectionism positively and negatively impact our happiness or what's the connection there? Yeah, it's a great question. So the two guiding questions that I always encourage people to ask is how is your perfectionism showing up and why is your perfectionism showing up? So the how is like all perfectionists are ambitious and they're striving towards an ideal. Healthy perfectionists understand that ideals are not meant to be achieved. They're just meant to inspire. Unhealthy perfectionists are like, I will have the ideal. (laughs) And so the- Giselle, I'm coming for you. (laughs) (laughs) So the how is like, are you striving in a way that is burning you out? Are you striving in a way that is um, really having a negative impact on your relationships with other people that you care about or with your health? Or are you striving in a way that makes you feel good, excited, curious, energetic, playful, you know, that you want to talk to people about and share with people. And so obviously the latter version is the sort of healthier 
flavor of perfectionism. And the why is like, why are you striving? This is such a big, hard question, particularly because we have been taught to want certain things, you know, kind of trained to want these, these traditional metrics of success. And sometimes we don't want them, you know? It's like, why are you striving? Are you striving because you think that that goal that you're after, X amount on the scale, X amount of dollars in your bank account, this relationship, this new title is going to allow you in some way to feel more of what you want to feel, feel more loved, feel more authoritative, feel more grown up, feel more beautiful, feel more worthy of being able to relax, right? Or are you striving because you love the process of striving and it feels good to strive towards something that reflects your values and desires? You know, one is healthy and one is not. And I think a lot of people strive for the purpose of um, trying to build joy into their life later. Like, oh, when I get the big house or when I do this, like I'm going to be so happy. Or I, I used to do this all the time with the holidays of like trying to perfect everything and make everyone around me feel happy and peaceful, which is actually trying to be controlling and control what other people feel and think and experience. Mm -hmm. um, I used to say, I can relax once everyone else is set. You know, and the holidays were like a big perfectionism trigger for me for maladaptive perfectionism. And it was really hard for me to recognize that because it seems like I'm doing a good thing or I'm, or I'm being nice or I'm not being controlling. Controlling people are, you know, brash and this and that. Actually, controlling people can also control with their desire to help, right? As um, I forgot, uh, Anne, Anne Lamott said, like, don't get your help all over people, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, of like trying to control all the ways that the people around you feel, control your kids being happy all the time or control, you know, the control is such an illusion. We really can't control very much at all, but we I'm, think we can. I'm very guilty of that last one. Just want everyone to be happier. Like my family. Want I want my happy. kids to be having a great time. I want them. It is, it's definitely a learning experience as a parent to be like, okay, I'm gonna validate that you are not happy right now. We're not happy. <laughs> and also that statement, I just want everyone to be happy. Another way to say that is I want to control everybody's emotions. Yeah. Oof. You know. I don't want to do it's that. Really, oh, it's yeah. a really controlling thing. And the, the difference between control and power is like, nobody likes being around controlling people. It doesn't matter whether you're controlling with good intentions or not. People feel that the, the attendant anxiety of someone who is trying to control a situation. And normally we're not aware that we're trying to control a situation. We're just trying to, again, make everybody happy, for example. Um, but you're really signaling an expectation and a pressure mm -hmm. that just perpetuates the maladaptive perfectionism onto your kids or onto your partner, or onto your team, or onto whoever you're trying to control. They feel that pressure from you and it doesn't feel good. You know, it doesn't feel connected. Right. You need the freedom to feel, experience, mm -hmm. move through our emotions. So let's, let's talk about the perfectionistic types from your book. Yeah. And I'm curious what you are and if you could kind of go through the different types of perfectionism, because I wouldn't have even thought about it coming up and helping or wanting, wanting someone to have a great holiday or everyone to be happy. So yeah, what are, what are the different types of perfectionism and how can they show up? Right. Okay. So perfectionism is not good or bad necessarily. It is dependent on the way you manage it, right? So all of these types have advantages and they have liabilities. The first is classic. And the classic perfectionist, I would say, is the closest 
type to what we think of as a perfectionist, right? So classic perfectionists on the pros side add structure to anything that they do. They're easily disciplined. Um, they're highly reliable. And, you know, they do what they say they're going to do. On the con side, they don't necessarily operate in a way that engenders collaboration or other people's input. <laughs> so it can be, um, it can leave people with a sense of trend being transactional, um, feeling disconnected to a classic perfectionist. And for the classic perfectionists themselves, they can feel really taken for granted because everyone kind of is like, oh, well, she's obviously going to plan the vacation because, you know, that's, that's her style. That's what she does. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you sometimes really have to advocate for yourself in that way. Then there is the messy perfectionist, right? And so messy perfectionists are in love with starting and they're start happy, as I like to say. So these are people who effortlessly push through the anxiety of a new beginning. They romanticize the beginning and have natural energy and enthusiasm for when they get to the middle part of the process, which is generally involves a lot more tedium. They want the middle part to be per as perfect as the beginning, and it's not. It never is. And so messy perfectionists put their hands in a thousand pots. And if you're not managing this type of perfectionism, you can say yes to a million things and actually commit to nothing. And so messy perfectionists don't believe in the saying, you know, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. You have to pick which means you have to experience loss. And we don't want to experience loss. Messy perfectionists are like, if you just have the heart, you can do it. And that's not true. We have natural restraints, like time, for example. Yeah. <laughs> um, the counterpart to the messy perfectionist is the procrastinator perfectionist. Procrastinator perfectionists want the beginning of something to be perfect before they start. And so... On the prose side, this type of perfectionist, these are really thoughtful people. They are not impulsive, unlike messy perfectionists. Procrastinative perfectionists can see a, you know, a situation from a 360 degree angle. They are really great at preparing. Um, the problem, if you're not managing this type of perfectionism, is you prepare past the point of diminishing returns and end up never actually starting. So it just turns into this kind of paralysis perfectionism, right? Um, now, when messy perfectionists and procrastinator perfectionists get together, Guilty. that's a good team, right? <laughs> that's a really good team because, you know, one person's strengths is another person's weakness, and, and so it goes. Um, then there's the intense perfectionist. An intense perfectionist wants a perfect outcome. So they want the end of the process to be perfect. And on the pro side, intense perfectionists, razor sharp focus, effortlessly direct. Um, they do not care if people like them or not. Right. Um, and so these are people, if you think of the public persona of like a Gordon Ramsay or Steve Jobs or Anna Wintour, um, they are great at getting to the outcome. But if you're not managing this type of perfectionism, you can get to the outcome at huge cost, right? So it's like, great, everything, if we use our holidays example, an intense perfectionist of the holidays is like, great, everything is perfect, but look around the table, everyone's miserable yeah. because, because you did all of this stuff to get to where you want it to be, but now nobody wants to be here with you because you did it in a way that hurt yourself or hurt other people. Um, intense perfectionists can burn the candle at both ends. And then lastly, there's the Parisian perfectionist. And this type of perfectionism is really interesting because it manifests interpersonally. So in our relationships. So the easiest way to describe this is that the Parisian perfectionist wants to be perfectly liked. Mm -hmm. And they also want to perfectly like others. They, their ideal that they're striving for is ideal connection. So a Parisian perfectionist can not care necessarily about upward mobility professionally, for example, because 
what they want is the ideal connection to themselves. They want to maybe understand themselves perfectly, understand their God perfectly. Um, and that's obviously an advantage in the sense that per Parisian perfectionists have such a live wire understanding of the power of connection. They're naturally warm, naturally inclusive. Um, and they're generally easy to connect with. But if you're not managing this kind of perfectionism, it can metastasize really quickly into people pleasing. And you're working so hard on connecting to other people that you abandon yourself in the process. And so now not only have you not connected to someone else, you're also disconnected from yourself. Wow. And through your quiz, you can be multiple different perfectionistic types. Yeah, that's a great point. So you can be like a messy perfectionist when it comes to dating, where you love the first date, you love the second date. Some of my friends are like, I hate the first, second and third dates. I just want to skip to like the middle and end of the relationship. That's where all the good stuff is. Not for messy perfectionists. Messy perfectionists are like, that. that's so intoxicating those first few dates. And then on your third date, when someone starts chewing really loudly, you're like, oh, yeah, <laughs> and things start to things start to unravel. Um, and so you can be a messy perfectionist when it comes to dating, but a really an intense perfectionist at work, or an intense perfectionist can be so exacting and have such high standards at work, but come home to a house that looks like it just got ransacked, because you know this is all fluid. And it's all very context dependent. So it depends which context you're in generally, that changes the way your perfectionism shows up. So if, like I said, for me during the holidays, I'm a classic perfectionist, which I am not at any other point in the year. Like during the holidays, I wear pencil skirts, I blow dry my hair, <laughs> you know, I like get very meticulous about things. That's not my general MO. Can we talk a little bit? about your general MO. And I mean, you wrote a book on perfectionism, like where do you yeah. fall on the scale? What, uh, you know, so what type I'm of like perfectionist a, are you? I'm like a 60% Parisian perfectionist, right? So connection is really important to me. And I always want more, right? I've never been like, I am as connected as I want to be with everyone in my life. Like there's a, a level of constant dissatisfaction but the dissatisfaction is not experienced as like a lack of peace or a lack of gratitude. It's, it's more like, oh, I can't wait for more, you know? And so that's an important distinction there. Um, and then I'm like 30% messy. I just want to do all the things. It's so hard to pick. It was so hard to pick what didn't go into this book and, and, Thank God for my editor, Nikki Papadopoulos, who helped me so much be like, Catherine, your book can't be 790 pages. Yeah. <laughs> um, because, you know, you can't put everything in a book. You can't marry all the people. You can't live in all the cities. You can't do all the jobs. But yeah. there's a part of me that will always want to do that, those things. And I love that part of me. You know, it's a good part. It gives me a lot of energy. I just have to make sure to manage it. And then the rest of the 10% is like a little bit intense, you know, where it's like, I want this thing and I want, and I'm going to get it. I feel like that. I mean, looking at your types, I can see how maybe it can be maladaptive, but I feel like all these perfectionistic types can be used in a really productive, adaptive way. Can you explain how you manage the negativity of that perfectionistic type and, and kind of like ensure that you're using these as strengths in an yeah. adaptive way. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad that you're, you're looking at it that way. Cause that's how I see it. And that's what I hoped people would see when I wrote this book of like, perfectionism is your strength. This is a great thing. You don't want to not have that impulse inside of you. That's pushing you. Not everybody has that in the way that perfectionists have that. So the biggest step, if you're only going to do one thing to mm -hmm. unleash your perfectionism and use it as a strength is to replace punishment with self-compassion. Mm -hmm. And 
I dedicate two chapters in the book to that because we don't really know how to recognize when we're punishing ourselves. We think of punishment in a literal way um, when actually punishments are extremely nuanced and subtle and often fly under the radar, particularly for high functioning people. Um, and we also don't understand what self-compassion is. We think of it as being super polite to ourselves or letting ourselves off the hook or in this kind of what I call it emotional petting way, this off-putting way of like, you're wonderful, you're great. And it's sort of like, that's really a shallow version of what self-compassion is. I use Dr. Kristen Neff's framework who's a brilliant researcher and has been studying self-compassion for decades. And she talks about the three skills involved in really responding to yourself compassionately. And there's so much research on this that, you know, self-compassion is not like an, a nice extra. It's not like a, a, a topping on something. It is the core work. So if you don't learn self-compassion as an adult, I mean, hopefully you learn it as a kid too. If you don't learn it, you can't grow. It's necessary for your growth to understand how to implement self-compassion. And in the absence of self-compassion, really the best you can hope for is stagnation. Mm -hmm. And so because we don't know what all this stuff is, like what's the difference between self-compassion and self-pity or dignity and respect or control and power, we don't really emphasize emotional literacy in our culture. So we don't know this stuff. You know, like I was in my 20s before I even heard the word boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I was like deep in therapy world. You know, so um, it's really about understanding what these things even are and that they're not just amorphous floating concepts, they're tools and they're resiliency building tools. And so that is, I think, the primary shift that healthy perfectionists learn to make. And it's not a one and done thing right? Self-compassion is something you have to continually use. But once you make that shift, a lot of the other stuff naturally falls into place. So what is that? We're going to leave people being like, so how do I give myself self-compassion? So what is the framework? Like, how do you actually? Okay. So I'll go through the three steps. Okay. Spl splash style. Okay. Okay. So one is common humanity. Okay. And that is understanding that your problem is common right? We are millions and billions of people who have lived several, several centuries. And when you're stuck in a problem and you feel like shit and you just feel terrible, you're like, oh, you feel alone and you feel like nobody's messing up in the way that I just messed up. Mm -hmm. And you, your problem feels very uncommon. Mm -hmm. And the more you understand that this is common, mm -hmm. the more you feel connected to humanity. Right. And so I describe this as like those handy grabber machines at the arcade. I don't know what Kelly is going on in your life right now, but I know there's something because you're a human being and that's the nature of being a human. Whatever your primary problem is right now, if someone plucked you up and put you down in a room of 50 people who were all talking about the same exact problem and you did nothing in that room, you, you didn't even open your eyes, you didn't speak, you just listened, you would feel better it would be curative for you because you'd be like, oh yeah, I'm not alone. <laughs> Other too. people have to deal with this. That's why listening to podcasts and, and that's why storytelling is so important because you're, you feel connected and we need to feel connected in order to grow. So that's the first step is common humanity. Um, the second step is kindness and kindness requires you to acknowledge that you are in pain. So when something goes wrong, we tend to describe it in external ways of like, that was a really hard meeting. And I would challenge people to go one level deeper of like, yes, that was a hard meeting. What do you feel? No, that was a really hard meeting. I feel embarrassed. Mm. I can't believe I said that, you know, and you can't be kind to yourself if you don't acknowledge that like being embarrassed hurts. It doesn't feel good. And kindness is about acknowledging you're in pain and then just doing one simple, kind thing. Like, do you want to, do you want some tea? Yeah. 
do you want a blanket? Are you cold? Like kindness is not about solving problems as much as it's about offering connection to yourself, right? And then the last thing is mindfulness. And that step is about understanding that whatever you're feeling or thinking is not the only thing you're feeling and thinking. So perfectionists, for example, feel disappointed a lot. And when you feel disappointed, a lot of people encourage you to not feel that way and say like, how do we get rid of the disappointment? And there's this silly idea that mindfulness is the kind of floating above the disappointment and detaching from it. That's not what mindfulness is. Mindfulness is saying, I feel so disappointed. This is terrible. But the better question of how do I not feel disappointed is what else do I also feel? And you're like, I feel disappointed, but you know what? I also feel relieved that at least now I know. I also feel curious about what to do next. I also feel excited about the dinner I have in two nights from now with my girlfriends who do not give a shit about any of this because they just love me and want to hang out with me, you know? And so when you turn your head and you can see your experience and your emotional landscape, um, in a broader, more elastic way, it helps that feeling of disappointment or whatever it is that you're feeling that feels that you feel stuck in. It helps it not eclipse the whole show. You know, that's what's scary about having hard feelings is they take over in a way and then we resist them and they get more powerful. And then we try to distract ourselves and, you know, we're running around all these things instead of just saying, I do feel that. What else do I feel? Putting people back in their bodies and allowing them to connect to humanity and connect to themselves and just be okay with that, which Mm -hmm. it is really interesting the way advice goes. It's the opposite. Like you said, it's just don't feel that way. Just move on. It's okay. (laughs) Yeah. Or like find gratitude for something. It's like, it's great to have gratitude a hundred percent. It's not great to have gratitude while you're simultaneously denying your experience. That's not healthy, Mm -hmm. you know, and you can be grateful and also really angry. You you don't have to pick, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so the reason self-compassion is so efficacious is because It makes you feel better. And when you feel good, you have more energy. And when you have more energy, you feel more capable of doing the stuff that you need to do. When you feel bad and you feel like shit, you have less energy. Your energy is drained. And all you feel capable of is sitting on your couch for hours, like checking out and watching Netflix and like eating mindlessly, you know? So it's almost like, how are we supposed to connect to the process or honor the, honor the process and connect to our feelings without ending up on the couch, (laughs) eating the snacks and watching Netflix. Like how do we, I want to end this podcast with what I think you've done for perfectionists, which is show that there's an adaptive form of perfectionism, that all of these different types can be really productive in your life. And It can be your superpower. Mm -hmm. How do we stay productive and, you know, live our, like our most, I want to say most happy and productive life with the perfectionistic types that we are? Yeah, it's a great question. I reframe the idea of productivity in the book and I read a life-changing article in Harvard Business Review several years ago by Tony Schwartz and Catherine McCarthy, who said, our problem is not that we need better time management, it's that we need better energy management. And the reason that you didn't do the thing that you meant to do yesterday that's been on your to-do list for three weeks is not that you ran out of the time to do it, it's that you ran out of the energy. And so I, I really found that idea to be so powerful. And I thought, well, then what does it mean to be productive? Because it doesn't just mean getting stuff off your to-do list. It means figuring out how to operate with premium energy, right? Mm -hmm. Like one hour of premium quality energy will serve you better than 10 hours approaching a task, rushed, resentful, exhausted, confused, disoriented, 
And so I think being productive includes anything that is energy giving to you, including sleeping, meandering through bookstores, having sex, watching Netflix. If you are watching Netflix and it feels good for you, that's the difference between restoration and numbing. When you're restoring and chilling, the thing that you just did made you feel good. When you're numbing, numbing doesn't make you feel good. It makes you feel nothing. You know, you're just like, so being productive is about understanding that you need premium quality energy to be your full self. And productive activities are activities that give you energy. I love that so much. I mean, it makes me, it does make me look at all the different things that I'm building in my life, in my career, with my family, with my husband. And it makes you ask the question, you know, like, how do I feel anticipating this? How do I feel in the experience? How do I feel Mm -hmm. when I'm reliving it or remembering it? And is it like energy producing? Yeah. And there's a value list in the book. Um, And it sometimes it requires you to revisit it. Like, what are, what do I really value? Values are so tricky because they all look so good on paper. It's like, sure. I value loyalty. I value, you know, creativity. I value this. I value that. But, but like, what do you value the most? And sometimes we just need to ask ourselves that because it's changing. We have to constantly recalibrate what's important to us in this particular season of our life. And so there are lots of exercises and frameworks and new ways of thinking about things in the book to just kind of jumpstart this new approach to that energy inside of you that you really sometimes might not be sure what to do with. So exciting. Thank you so much for taking the time to show this side of perfectionism and to give us the tools to really look at what we're doing every day to, to ensure that it's energy producing, to I kind of like own who we are and yeah. And, and enjoy who we are. Yeah, it is. It, it, it's definitely a book I'll share with Chris just because I think, you know, he identifies with the maladaptive form of perfectionism, but Mm-hmm. I even just in today's conversation, I know I'm going to go home tonight and just be like, there are so many wonderful things about this side of you or this part of you, mm-hmm. you know, because yeah. the world has, I mean, I know it is mostly for women, but the world has told us that perfectionism is negative. Yeah. And I have a little, I have a little shout out to men in there too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because men suffer from their, you know, uh, the approach to perfectionism they're supposed to take too, which is like, don't have boundaries, just go after what you want madly, you know? Right. Right. Well, it's just, are we just in the rat race? Are you just in the, you know, the proverbial hamster wheel for your whole life and then you die? Like, where Mm -hmm. is the pleasure? And I mean, really just being thoughtful about the time we have because it is, yeah not very much. It feels like forever, but it's so fleeting and so fast. And it seems to be moving at warp speed for me in this stage of life. So Mm -hmm. having beautifully said, having these conversations really makes me take a beat and say, how am I being thoughtful? How Mm -hmm. with my days and my energy and my time? Yeah. I love that. My pleasure. Yeah. There's a line in the book that is you are not on the earth to complete tasks and die. You know, where it's like everything you just said, I couldn't agree with more. So I hope people read the book. It's The Perfectionist Guide to Losing Control, A Path to Peace and Power. And if you want to find more of my work, I'm on Instagram at Catherine Morgan Schaffler. And that's also the name of my website. So CatherineMorganSchaffler.com, where you could take the quiz, find out your profile, tell us what it is. It was really fun. I'll put the, also the link to the quiz in the show notes, along with all of the links to buy your book, follow you on social and check out your website. Catherine, thank you so much for being here and lending your time. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.